What are the plans from the European Commission to build alternative fuel infrastructure? Um, and what do we mean with that, actually? Let's start with that, because uh, we travel. We travel either by car, by plane, by boat, or transport goods in that manner. And we do that across Europe, and we have one economic area, one economic region in Europe. Uh, and since the 90s, uh, we already have a TENT network, TENT network, the Trans-European Transport Network. So this is already pre-battery, uh, electric car, pre-charging infrastructure, pre-hydrogen. Um, there was simply a strategic agenda to make sure that any region in, the, in Europe would be uh, reachable and that traveling from one side to the EU to the other side is easily possible and that there is some sort of structural development along those trade routes. Um, that main, again, that had little to do with charging infrastructure and hydrogen, but we build on that by up, basically updating this network to cope with a, an influx of battery electric vehicles, um, uh, more sustainable aviation fuel and um, uh, um, uh, uh, electric uh, solutions and shipping switching to. Um, so ports would obviously across Europe also need infrastructure to, to deal with that. To give you an idea, this is the um, tent network in Europe. And you see that we make a distinction between the core network and the comprehensive network. The core network is the, the bold lines, they connect all regions, uh, oh, sorry, they um, uh, make sure that every, um, uh, that you can easily travel from one side of the European Union to the other side. The comprehensive network makes sure that every region in Europe is um, reachable and, and connected. To, to make sure that there is good coverage. This, uh, this distinction is critical because these directives also um, um, make a, a clear distinction in the, the rules that apply. Um, for cars, for road transport, um, every 60 kilometers there has to be charging infrastructure um, by 2026. So that would make sure that uh, range anxiety is, uh, is gone. So by 2026, every 60 kilometers at least, so probably more frequent, but at least every 60, sec uh, 60 kilometers, there is at least 300 kilowatts of charging uh, capacity, of which at least one 150 kilowatt charger. Uh, by 2031, that uh, capacity would have increased to 600 kilowatts uh, with at least two charges of 150 kilowatts. 150 kilowatts charges your car pretty quickly. Um, so in, in 20 minutes, you, get, you, you, do, you already get very far. Um, for, uh, this is, by the way, the 60 kilometers applies both to the core and comprehensive network. Now for trucks and heavy transport, there's a split between the core and comprehensive network. So every 60 kilometers on the core network and every, every 100 kilometers on the comprehensive network, there has to be charging infrastructure for big trucks. So you also see 1,400 kilowatts by 2026 and 3,500 kilowatts by 2031. It's not just about charging infrastructure. It's also about user friendliness. You, you need enough payment options. If, you're, if I travel from the Netherlands to Greece, or to Italy, I want several payment options to make sure that I can actually pay when I'm, when I'm charging there. I can even start charging. Uh, the pricing structure, and it has to be transparent what I'm buying and at what cost. So there are rules for that. It's basically consumer protection. Um, the, some, something simple like signposting. Uh, the same uh, signs uh, along the routes throughout the European Union so you know charging uh, station is ahead. Uh, and a smart charging, uh, obviously um, a smart charging, so um, um, not continuous charging, but s charging when it is most beneficial or at the lowest cost. Uh, that should not just be possible in your own neighborhood or own country, but also when you cross the border, across the European. So you need the same protocols to make that happen. Um, there are um, rules to make sure, uh, in, in the Green Deal, to make sure this all happens. Hydrogen is also a fuel that is important for road transport. Uh, every 150 kilometers, there has to be at least two tons uh, per day capacity 
um, at 700 bars for heavy transport, because hydrogen, probably you can also uh, um, ch uh, uh, charge, <laughs> not charge, uh, refill uh, with a car, but this, uh, um, cars are probably all, all gonna become, or mostly become battery electric, so this is really for heavy transport. This is an obligation by 2031, so you, you see a more lenient timeline there. On LNG, currently, um, LNG um, uh, infrastructure should be, there should be an appropriate number uh, of installations along the, the, the core and uh, comprehensive network. That obligation is removed per 2026. That doesn't mean that they, uh, all LNG installations have to be uh, removed, but the obligation is removed. So it probably will become harder after, in the years after 2025 to travel based on LNG on the road in Europe. Then we move to ports. Again, the same idea. We have a core and a comprehensive network in both Europe and, and, and the Netherlands. I zoomed in on the Netherlands just to give you a, a more close-up. You see a lot of inland ports and some ocean ports, um, some core, so, uh, many comprehensive. Um, what, is the, what are the rules for ports and ships? Um, well, actually, by 2025, LNG is phased out for you could say for road transport, but for, um, for shipping, this is actually still a very vi viable alternative to move away from even more polluting marine diesel oil equivalents, which is really the, the dirtiest fuel, uh, fuel imaginable, almost. Uh, so from by 2025 and onwards, um, there should be an LNG installation in ports, allowing seagoing ships along 10th core network. Also, um, uh, shore power should be installed, both for inland and ocean-going ships. Specifically for inland ships, by 2025, along the core route, there should be at least one shore power installation, and uh, along the comprehensive network by 2030. For ocean-going ships, by 2030, along core and comprehensive networks, so all harbors, 90% of the demand for um, shore power should be met by harbors, and this is 90% of the demand from ships greater than 5,000 gross tonnage. And remember from the chapter about the ETS for the marine sector, only ships greater than 5,000 gross tonnage were on, are under the emission trading scheme for the marine sector. They will also be inclined mostly to switch to more sustainable alternatives, and 90% of their demand should be met by 2030 in terms of shore power. Then we go to air travel, airports, and infrastructure for sustainable fuel uh, in that sector. Again, core and comprehensive network, you get the drill. Um, again, also a need for shore power for, for, for planes. By 2025, all gates should have an, a, a charging infrastructure or uh, electricity point so that when they're parked, uh, they don't have to burn uh, kerosene. By 2030, also all outposts, so basically parking spots away from the terminal, away from the gates, should have um, electric infrastructure. Uh, oh, uh, I go too quickly. And by 2030, all of these outposts uh, charging infrastructure should also be connected to the grid or local renewables. Because of course you don't want diesel generators to be running on airports to produce the electricity for that, that goes in the plane. So this is an additional requirement to make sure that either uh, the electricity is um, uh, retrieved from the grid, which is already becoming cleaner and cleaner by the day, or from local renewables, which is by definition renewable. Um, of course, the <laughs> planes burn most of the fuel while flying, not while being parked. So there's also an obligation for fuel suppliers to airports and to, to aircraft operators to provide 63% sustainable aviation fuel by 2050. Uh, uh, so uh, kerosene is slowly pushed out. Um, um, again, you see here a pathway by 2030, only limited amounts of sustainable aviation fuel um, uh, is required, but that increases steeply in the years afterwards. This is also sustainable aviation fuel is not easy to scale up. Uh, but as CO2 prices are probably going to rise between now and 2030 and infrastructure and investments are uh, coming up to speed, 
um, this may be this uh, scale up may be attainable afterwards, and, and that's what you see here. If uh, um, a thirty uh, sorry, 63% of kerosene is replaced by sustainable alternatives. That would, of course, mean a lot. And part of this, but it, the gra graph would become too complicated for you to show, part of this stuff should also come uh, from synthetic um, uh, fuels. So not from, let's say, uh, 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 biomass, and, uh, but really from uh, CO2, hydrogen, and through, well, it's a chemical process, but make synthetic uh, fuels out of that. It would make the story a bit more co complex. Um, dive into the directive if you want. Uh, and uh, another rule that is critical because sustainable aviation fuels are bound to be more expensive than traditional kerosene. An another rule is that aircraft operators cannot, can no longer, let's say, um, this is a game they've been playing for a long time. A plane would fly from, let's say, Frankfurt to Amsterdam, short flight. Uh, price, uh, kerosene prices in Amsterdam are higher than in Frankfurt, so you would um, um, fuel uh, maximum, take on maximum fuel in Frankfurt so that you don't have to refuel in Amsterdam and avoid higher prices. This could be a bottleneck for the take up of sustainable aviation fuel. However, there's a new rule in this Green Deal package which states that if you fly from Amsterdam or from Frankfurt and, or any other airport in, 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 in Europe, then at least 90% of the uh, fuel that is used to make that flight would have to be fueled over the course of a year on that airport. So this, is basic, this basically means that you have a guarantee that sustainable aviation fuel will be taken off um, and that they will have to pay the price, the higher price. So probably tickets will also become more expensive in due time. Short summary on sustainable infrastructure. The tent network is already there. There is already a strategic plan for development of it, but it's just a matter of making it future-proof. Charging infrastructure should be available every 60 kilometers and hydrogen every 50 kilometers. Shore power becomes mandatory and sustainable aviation fuel should comprise, should, should in total be 63% uh, of uh, total fuel needed by 2050. This is an obligation on fuel suppliers. Um, let me quickly check if there are questions. Why not allow sustainable road fuel for uh, heavy duty transport similar to SAF? Why not allow sustainable road fuel for heavy duty transport similar to SAF? Well, um, I think this will be kickstarted development for sustainable fuel for road transport simply because traditional fuels will become much more um, um, expensive. Obviously, when you have a limited amount of um, fuel available, um, I would say bring it to a sector that is hardest to abate or where there are no alternatives. And uh, looking at battery um, uh, developments, cost developments, uh, charging infrastructure, energy densities, probably for a lot of road transport, battery electric solutions may also be, provide a solution. Hydrogen may provide a solution for road transport. Those options are less evident for, for air travel. So. From that point of view, let's, not, um, let's avoid that these sustainable aviation fuels are going to uh, uh, sectors that have, have clear alternatives. Uh, and th those alternatives are less clear for, for air travel. Um, do these regulations have escape routes if technologies, for example, batteries, charging stations, electric, electrical supply, cannot keep up with the CO2 reduction requirements? Do these regulations have escape routes? Um, the escape route, uh, <laughs> the key escape route is that um, uh, they just keep paying that price and end users will face higher and higher costs. Um, and as long as there is a level playing field and a carbon border adjustment mechanism, there is no incentive for uh, companies to leave the European Union or to export from a, a pollution haven. Um, but it, what it will do, and uh, um, uh, upon introduction of these uh, CO2 pricing mechanisms is cl create a clear path and need for these clean alternatives. That will also create a need and a willingness for investors to step in and actually provide the scale up. Again, many technologies are already available and the best way to scale them up and make them available is just doing it, setting up pilot plans, investing. And, and uh, as these balloons are introduced, as taxes are becoming, are biting more, as the regulations come to haunt uh, fuel suppliers, 
those uh, investments will come online.